Welcome to the Wild Ones podcast, episode 27. This is the show where we chat about bike stuff. Francis is still away, but don't worry, because this week I'm joined by producer Emily and very special guest, my best friend in the entire world, Perida App... No, I've done it wrong again, haven't I? <laughs> Perry from Pendulum. <laughs> You're my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> but I did up Gwyneth. Predia. Predia, perfect. I'm getting better at it. You are. You are indeed. You did like telling me that I pronounced your name wrong. Yeah. But you can. Ju- you just said it properly, so yeah. Shamai, satoiti. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's Welsh. I, I literally ran out there. That's That's about <laughs> as much as I've got. So Perry, as I said, is the guitarist from the band Pendulum. He has also been a pro cycling commentator on Welsh language channel S4C, S. Pedwarek to some of us for the past 10 years. This, so next year is going to be your 10th year no, commenting. No, no, this year this was. Year was. Tenth, yeah. So we've done 10 years of the tour, five years of the Giro, and we did the Vuelta for the first time this year as well. So I've done 16 grand tours in total. That is more than me. Yeah, it's like, it's like I'm George Hincapie, isn't it? So as I like to remind you, uh, probably more than I should, you are a legit rock star. How is it juggling being a rock star and a cycling commentator it's a bit odd isn't it? well it, those two jobs are well if i either of those jobs are, are odd anyway but having doing two of them at the same time is slightly mad the um my first year um when i got asked to do it um they asked me if i was free in july i said no because i was on tour so i flitted between touring and um and, and commentating as well, so but on the second the second year I did it, um, we start. It was when it started in Utrecht in 2015, and I was on tour with Faithless at the time. So in Netherlands and Belgium, so I was fl- flitting between the two, getting a train from the Tour de France to a gig, then a train back to get. So I had about in about five days, I had about maybe ten hours sleep because I was wasn't sleeping at all. I was just travelling. I, su- I suppose, worst case scenario, you can do the tour in the day and gig by night. Yeah, that's kind of what was happening. But if you do that, you don't get any sleep, yeah. which I found out many times. It gets a bit tiring after a while because the, the sleep def- deprivation so- certainly does catch up with you. Right, so we move on to this week's debrief. Um, as luck would have it, our first news story is actually from the world of pro cycling. At the weekend, Jumbo Visma excitedly announced that they signed a new rider, Belgian pro, Kian Kian Etterbrooks. Can you tell me how that's actually pronounced? Kian Etterbrooks. Oh, did I? Was that right? right yeah. So the, the phonetic writing of this on yeah. my screen has actually worked really well. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. <laughs> uh, but bosses from his current team, Borahans Grower, were left scratching their heads because he's apparently still under contract with them until the end of 2024. So the 20-year-old rider is a strong up-and-comer. He finished eighth in the Vuelta. And Jumbo Visma clearly thought that it was a done deal, putting out a gushing press statement that he is the perfect fit for their team. But Borhans Grower responded with their own statement, saying, Kian is and will remain a member of Borhans Grower. He is contractually bound to us until the 31st of December, 2024. Um, so you hit, there's two teams basically saying he's under contract to them. Kean's management company then got involved, saying that he had started legal proceedings. They hadn't commented on a precise reason for the contract termination, but Dutch newspaper AD alleges that the rider felt bullied by the riders and the staff. The team has denied the allegations. Um, do you know anything? Have, have you come across this story? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a bit of a mess, really, isn't it? Roglic has gone, to, gone the other way. He actually terminated his contract with Yumbo in October. Right. Because it, it all depends on your contract, I suppose. If you can terminate it, there, there must be some sort of get-out clause in it. Yeah. And Roglic's get-out clause, he must have loads of them in his contract. Yeah. But, you know, Erta Brooks is quite a young guy. We don't know what his um, contract is like um, or how good his agent is. I know that Roglic's agent is a guy called Mattia Galli and he's an amazing agent. Yeah. You know, he's very, he, he looks after um, Vingago as well. You know, he's a very, very good agent. So I'm not sure how good Kian, Kian Erterbrooks is, is. And it all depends what's in his contract, really. So um, we don't know the actual full story. I, I guess he must be confident enough that there is some kind of termination clause in there for him to have agreed 
a contract with someone else. But there's obviously some kind of missed communication somewhere, isn't there, for this to have happened? I think his agent must have told him to say what, what he has to say. Because yeah. um, it's obviously that he wants out of the team. Um, he kind of slagged off his team at at a few of the races, I think. And and I, he complained about the equipment as well, about his bike or whatever. So it's obviously he doesn't want to be there. He's obviously not enough on a on enough money, well, he thinks he's not enough on enough money, and he's been touted as the new Eddie Merckx, another new Eddie Merckx, <laughs> um, and uh, he obviously wants more money, and that Yumbo are, are obviously offered it to him. So yeah, yeah, we shall see. And today, um, uh, Yumbo announced that he's going to their training camp today. I think it's in Spain somewhere, so probably Denia, but um, or. It's all, so it is all a bit of a mess, isn't it? It's yes, but if there's a rider and he's outspoken, so he's saying, "I don't want to be in this team." Why would you want them? Yeah, because the team then is going to go. It's going to give them so much bad press next year. Imagine if they kept him and, and go, "Yeah, you're not going anywhere," and he's just there being miserable, you know, kicking and, off every and, opportunity, yeah, and slagging the team off again. You know, it's not going to look very good at all. So. There must has to be some sort of compensation thing involved, you know. And I think Bora want as much money of, of, as possible out of him and from uh, Yumbo. Well, I guess it, yeah, I guess a lot of it comes down to that, doesn't it? Because there might be some kind of clause, a bit like the football stuff, where there ne- needs to be compensation to Bora Hans Grower, and therefore, if they go, no, we really wanted him, then they've got a public case for, well, you're going to have to make sure it's a, we're appropriately compensated, rather than we wanted to get rid of him anyway. Yeah, well, a similar thing happened last year. In F1, there's um, uh, a driver called Oscar Piastri, and he was with Alpine, and he was their test driver for four years. And um, and uh, Alpine said Oscar Piastri is going to be our our second driver uh, uh, next year, <laughs> and he just tweeted, "Oh no, I'm not," because <laughs> <laughs> uh, he then went to McLaren. Yeah. So it was a very very similar situation there, but he went on Twitter and said, "I'm not staying with you guys. I know you've spent all this money with me." Um, training me up as uh, an F1 driver, but I'm going to McLaren. They've got more money than you. Yeah, so. I guess. You, well, yeah. If you've got the opportunity to join a team which, on paper, is doing better, why wouldn't you? Absolutely. And and I guess y- it's the same for well, yes, Sladi or Yumbo Visma. Well, Yumbo are the best team on the planet at the minute, and why would you want to go there? I mean, you've got Vinger go, and you've got Kuss. Um, they're they're not. They might retire in a few years, but Eta Brooks is like 20 years old. So mm. him in five years' time will be in the same situation as Vingago. And if he's the new work, Merckx, he's going to win loads of grand tours. Mm-hmm. If I was a junior as well, I would want, if I had the opportunity to be in a team where I could learn from someone more experienced that has achieved the stuff that I want to achieve, that seems like a no-brainer to me. Absolutely. And... I mean, just look at the, their roster. It's just it's just an, a nuts roster, mm. you know, with um, yeah, Wout van Aert and, and Christophe Laporte, you know, just those two guys, you know, uh, and their classics and classic team, you know, Dylan van Barle, you know, just it's just an amazing team. And if I was a twenty-year-old, I'd want to be in that team as well, and I would want to double my money because it's, it's a no-brainer, really. So this will be storm in a teacup for a couple of weeks and then I think yeah we'll see him in well it's young Yumbo Lisa bike for next year isn't it so, it is yeah yeah I'll see we, I think we'll see him in their strip on the subject of their current roster and big po- big pro contract disputes Wout van Aert found himself being sued for breach of contract in 2019 by his old team when he joined Yumbo Visma uh, Van Aert originally won his case and avoided 1.1 million euros in damages, but the decision was overturned in 2021 and Van Aert was ordered to pay 662,000 euro compensation for his move to uh, Jumbo Visma. So I wonder if Jumbo Visma just throw money at getting the best talent and don't care about what what the consequences. Well, it kind of, remi- kind of reminds you of um, Sky, you know, just chuck a lot of money at mm. a lot of very, very good cyclists. And that's how you get 
end up getting the best team. At this point, legal proceedings are still ongoing and we have to, so we'll have to watch this space to see what actually happens over the coming weeks. On the subject of being a commentator, mm-hmm. how do you deal with hard to pronounce names? Because we, I'm rubbish at pronouncing names at the best of times as sh- clearly shown by your name, which is Welsh and me being Welsh and I should be able to pronounce it. <laughs> how do commentators get it right? Because well, we do it in the Welsh language. We're all bilingual. Some of us are trilingual as well. I used to know French. Um, my French is terrible now. I used to be really good at French. And um, another one of the guys is a fluent Spanish speaker. Another one is a German speaker. So um, there's a lot of that involved. Because we're bilingual, it's a lot easier for us to pronounce uh, names that aren't f- from the UK. Yeah. So, um, and, that's, and we actually do go through the names uh, before um, the racing starts, just to make sure. There's a list on the wall in, in our comm booth all the riders and all the do- uh, dodgy pronunciations, we, we go through them, make sure that they're right. Yeah. And then find, if there's one we're not quite sure, we will find out. Because um, there's plenty of, you just have to Google it and you will find out. Is your memory good enough to remember it or do you write, or do people write things out phonetically? Um, my memory's good enough. Some of them, I've, I've got photographic memory anyway, so oh, <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really lucky that way. But, um, because we're bilingual, we've got kind of bit of bit of an, got a bit of an advantage there anyway. So, uh, yeah, and, and one of our other languages being Welsh, which is a notoriously difficult language to pronounce anyway. I sure. think that's another advantage. <laughs> How did you actually get into cycling commentating? Well, um, a friend of mine works for this production company, and he'd seen me putting up photos on Twitter of me up on Stelvio or wherever. And uh, he phoned me up and said, you like cycling, don't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, all right, I said, right. And uh, we're, putting, he said, um, we're putting together a pitch for Espadarec, for S4C, to try and get the Tour de France. Um, would you like to be involved in it? I went, yeah. So that was it. And he phoned me back six weeks later and he, and he said, oh, we got the gig. What are you doing in July? That's when I said, I'm touring. So, um, yeah, never done anything like that, I'd, I'd done some TV stuff in the past, well, quite a lot of t- television stuff, but I'd never done any sports stuff, and I'd certainly never done any um, commentary. So we were in at the deep end. So the, um, I do the commentating, I also do punditry on location as well. So I'd be sat, uh, sat there, was stood there uh, at the finishing line with a microphone, just talking about the race that's just happened or whatever, and I do some interviewing as well. So, yep. so the first day, would have been in Yorkshire, 2014, and I was in front of the camera talking about sports, which I'd never done in my entire life. And no rehearsal, just went bang straight in, which is a bit nuts. It's a good job you're a cycling geek then. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I, do, I, I do know quite a lot about it because I'm a bit of a nerd, so... Um, so yeah, so I think that's why they got me in to do it. Yeah, so the, the show is in Welsh language. Yeah. And then, obviously, you're not interviewing people in Welsh, so presumably you just drop into English for the interviews. Sometimes we do interview people in Welsh. Um, Stevie Williams, in fact. Um, we were I, inter- I interviewed him in Welsh at the Giro this year, so um, some of the Welsh riders do speak Welsh. I'm assuming Garrett Thomas is like me in that he doesn't actually speak Welsh. He, he understands a bit. He, uh, he speaks a little bit. Um, Sarah, his wife, worked with us uh, for the first two years on the show. So, um, and Sarah's a uh, first language Welsh speaker. So, um, she's been teaching him, and but he knows a bit of Welsh. So yeah. He's, um... Next up, Bradley Wiggins has made a big surprise revelation this week in that he doesn't actually ride a bike anymore. He said it's because he doesn't like the person he became when he was on it. He made these comments as part of a six part BBC documentary on imposter syndrome. He also said, I was the most confident bike rider when I was on the bike, but step off it and I had to step back as Bradley Wiggins because the bike was where I was most comfortable and it gave me all my confidence in my life. Uh, He's well known for his unique style and funny moments on podiums, but apparently he has no memory of standing on the Champs-Élysées or any other Olympic podium. He said that the only memory he has is watching it back on TV. He also said he started growing his sideburns and mod hair and clothing because he was self-conscious at being looked at looked at even and wanted a distraction are you a fan of bradley wiggins yeah i think he's great how could you not be well yeah he's, he's amazing he's a 
bloody nice bloke as well. Um, his because he does a lot of tour stuff. I, I know him through that. So no, it's uh, but going back to the thing about not riding his bike. A lot of the pros, after they finished their their job yeah. as uh, as a bike rider, um, a lot of them don't want to see a bike ever again. Yeah, because uh, I know quite a few of the guys that used to ride world tour and uh, in the other ranks as well and because they used to train so hard you know through the years that they were professional they never ever want to see that torture instrument again you know? yeah it's uh there's quite a few of them you'd be surprised you know and yeah a lot of them run instead and just keep fit some just don't even bother keeping fit at all because uh, it, they it's such a horrible memory for them just training I, th I think something that's really hard to deal with, even as an amateur, is being historic fitness. And, and I think probably when you are at that, the highest level in the world, it must be really hard to like, re to like normalize, like w learn what's like normal. Mm. And that probably causes lots of issues. And therefore, like, I've, like I wouldn't be surprised if Bradley Wiggins ends up riding bikes again in the future just because he po pulls around with like his kids or something or other. But it's just, he almost needs to like redefine what it is. And I imagine that's why why some then go into running and things because it's, it's a new benchmark. Mm. You're not going like, well, I could be a pro. You're going, well, how fast can I run? Okay, cool. Yeah, but uh, I keep on reading about uh, if you're a pro athlete, you need to detrain. Yeah. It takes about a couple of years for your body to... I mean, if you just stop training, your body goes into some sort of shock mm -hmm. and you need to carry on training for a couple of years just Taper to it down wean yourself the other off way. of it. Yeah, it's, it's an odd thing, but I can totally understand why he doesn't want to do it. You know, it's you know, just put yourself in that situation. You, you're out training, doing six hours a day and it, you know, in sunny weather or in horrible weather as well. You know, it, it is going to affect the way you think about that instrument, isn't yeah. it? I, on the subject of music, I remember when I was young, it, I, I remember people always saying to me, you should teach drums, you should teach drums. And I always just remember at the time thinking, I don't, I don't, want, it to, I don't want it to feel like work. I, w I want music to always just be this like fun, playful space. I was, I was fearful that if I make it work, then I will, it will lose that kind of like space, that, that, that thing I get from it. Yeah, and and I think that's ultimate. You know, like you, you ride a bike when you're young because you enjoy it. It becomes a, a job that's like absolutely brutal, and then you get to a point where you're like, well, maybe like maybe not anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was asked a few years ago the Indie Pack um, that the bike race in Australia you know, that went from Perth mm -hmm. to Sydney. Um, I was asked by one of the guys who did that in the first year. Said, Would you ever be interested in doing it? I went, no way. <laughs> I said, why? Because I enjoy riding my bike. And if I did that, I'd hate it. Yeah. And it just looked, looked horrible, you know, riding what, 23 hours a day or whatever, and kipping down for an hour, then riding again. Like that would destroy my love of the bike. I, I love riding my bike, but, you know, I love riding in beautiful places, but putting yourself through that, I know I'll l learn to hate it. Mm -hmm. So I can see exactly where they're coming from. Have you had that effect with music? So presumably you learned how to, you got into music at a young age because you just loved music. And obviously it's now your career. Has that had an impact on your enjoyment of it? Not really, no. I I've been really lucky that everybody that, everybody that I've been involved with uh, professionally uh, in music, I've really enjoyed the music. I don't think I could do music that I didn't enjoy, but I, I actually quite like all types of music anyway. So, but it's not about the music as well. It's about personalities. And most people who work in music, especially tour music, are really nice people. Because if they weren't really nice people, they wouldn't have that job. Mm -hmm. you know, half the job, as well as being proficient in your instrument, is getting along with people. Now, if you're on tour and you're a bit of an idiot, if you're a musician or if you're part of the crew, you're not going to get asked back if you're a bit of a dick. Yeah. So it's, um, luckily enough, in the music world, most people aren't dicks, So That definitely explains then why I've made, never made it in the music industry. <laughs> Are you a <laughs> Oh, dear. 
<laughs> Depends who you ask, I think. <laughs> Right, so uh, moving on to the last piece of news, I think. So, Halfords have been getting some flack online this week after a picture emerged of a very dodgy-looking Christmas bike display. The display bike in question was a silver Halfords' own brand Carrera mountain bike. It had been put on a festive-themed plinth with the handlebars wrapped in tinsel, and it had a couple of glaring errors with the setup. The handlebars were in line with the wheel, the way it arrives when you take it out of the box, the fork was backwards. The front mug guard is attached to the down tube, trapping the externally routed shifting cables. The picture was posted online by a customer who branded them health frauds. And someone else said, you would never display a bike like this if you knew anything about bikes. <laughs> I personally think it's a little bit unfair. It is unfair because if you know Halfords, you know that every bike displayed looks like that. <laughs> it's every single one of them. Because you obviously get a guy in the in the paint department to put it together it's not you know obviously the bike guy wasn't in um, or maybe wasn't was in but um but you know halfords it's not a bike shop it's a shop with a bike department in it and even when they started selling boardman bikes back in the day they'd look like that you know with their forks back to front you know there'd be loose spokes it's because they're not a dedicated bike shop and um and if it's not a, a dedicated local bike store, you will end up with monstrosities like this, yeah. I'm afraid. But it, it, it feels to me like it's uh, an example of someone that runs a shop or whatever has said, can you pull that bike out, stick it on that stand and chuck this tinsel on it? Yeah. And they've literally just pulled it straight out of a box, put it straight on the stand, which if you knew nothing about bikes, is probably what you would do. Yeah. You know, we know bikes inside out, so we know that you need to turn the wheel around, put the bars in, etc., etc., etc. But at the end of the day, I, you know, it's a it's a display. I don't personally no. see a problem with it. No, there is probably an argument that perhaps it confuses people because people might see it and go, "Oh, well, that's the way that the wheel is meant to be facing," when obviously it isn't. I mean, it's if I was buying a new bike, I'd never go to Half Halfords to buy a new bike anyway. Yeah, um, I don't think many cyclists would but most people in the uk buy their first bike from halfords mm. you know um whether it be a, back in the day mine was a rally chopper and, you know, that's usually the first port of call when a parent goes oh i'm gonna buy a bike for for a kid my first ever bike was yeah. a man a matt mango bmx all right that we bought from halfords yeah most uk kids in the uk because the first thing that a parent thinks, thinks of when go, going to buy a bike is, where did I get my bike from? Halfords. You mm. know what? I'm going to go to Halfords and buy my bike. It's, it's where kids get their first bikes yeah. usually. And it's not for bike nerds like us. It's for people who pootle about, you know. And But and, but the Carreras, they're really good bikes, aren't they? Well, you won't race them, but, you know. It's okay for commuting things. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. That, I mean, I, I see loads of them around. We've got one here somewhere. I think we did. Yeah. We did an entry level bike video on one. It was. It was all right. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that if someone wanted to buy the bike, they would have set it up correctly. Yes, but I'm not going to say that as fact. No. That is speculation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I, I'll go back to the, saying a bike bike nerds like us would never ever buy a bike from Halfords anyway. It's non-bike nerds that buy their bikes from there. Unless it was a Boardman. Did they sell, still sell Boardman? Uh, I think they bought Boardman, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They, yeah. they did it once upon a time. I don't yeah. know. I haven't yeah. seen, a, I haven't seen yeah. Boardmans around in a long time. No. Yes, yeah. Does um, anyone know in the comments of this video slash podcast, let us know what happened to Boardman. You yeah. can email in as well if you want. Yeah. Wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk. Now, on to our big question. What cycling moments would the most memorable for you to comment on? So you've been commenting 16 Grand Tours over the last decade. Yeah. Um, I want to know some of the most iconic moments that you've had a microphone in your face and you've been going, oh my God. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, some of these uh, I've been commentating and some of these um, was me there on the ground actually... Um, on location yeah. in front of the camera. So they're not all commentary. The first one was 
the first day of the tour. Can I, as, as a non-TV person, that's yeah. the same thing to me. Commentating and being there with oh, the Okay, all right, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'm sure it's a different job to you, but to me it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, for me, a commentary is when you're in the comm booth going, ah, blah, 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 and, um, and then being on location, is you're kind of presenting as well. So, Got you. Yeah. So uh, the, the first stage I, we ever did with the Tour de France, we finished in Harrogate. And that's when Cav fell off his bike at the finishing line and broke his collarbone. And uh, stage one, and that happened right in front of me. And I, and I saw what happened, and I saw him go like that. And I saw the way that he held his body. Went, oh no, oh mate. Yeah, that's the first ever, first ever stage that yeah. you were part of. Yeah. And it was the 2014 Tour de France that yeah. started or in, finished in, in Harrogate. Yeah, yeah. when it started in Yorkshire. And it was, um, you know, it was gutting, you know. And to see, you know, you could see his jowl just go down. I knew exactly what happened. Yeah. Oh, no, he's broken his collarbone. And, you know, starting in the UK and... Yeah, you know, for a British rider, for that to happen to him, you know, it's just must terrible. Be, that's, yeah, probably just the UK part of that must have been yeah. so, like, significant. And yeah. yeah he so that's stage to... one that he got uh, got the injury. So can you imagine if he would have gone on to win a bunch of stages mm -hmm. in 2014, he would have beaten Merckx's record by yeah. now and not just equal it. So, yeah. What could have happened, eh? Yeah. Well, but that, that was still gutting. Can. Yeah. Still can <laughs> somehow. Yeah, but the, 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 that was totally gutting. Uh, just to see, and the way that he held it. I, oh, mate. What other ones have you got for us then? Oh, well, Paris Nice. Geraint won. Geraint Thomas won the 2016 Paris Nice, and that's the first time um, we ever realised that he was a GC rider because yeah. he's a classics guy, wasn't he? Um, and then he won Paris Nice, and I thought that's the first time I thought, oh my god, he's a bit good. This guy. You can actually do something. Because when we started broadcasting from the tour, he was the poster boy, but he was a domestique. Yeah. You know, we weren't expecting him to win anything, you know, but he was, he was Geraint Thomas, the best rider in Wales, and he happens to be a, a Grand Tour rider, and um, he's domestique, but we didn't care. And then we were com I was commentating on Paris Nice, and I was there in the booth when he won the damn thing. I was just like... Oh, okay, right. This is this is getting very interesting. So yeah, it was quite a nice surprise for us all. And then, a couple of years later, well, twenty eighteen, well, twenty seventeen, um, Dusseldorf stage one of of the tour. Uh, he won the time trial. First Welshman ever to wear a yellow jersey. This is this is pretty good. I remember that really yeah. well as well because yeah. that was again one of those ones where you start sending it to people back home, yeah. being like, "What is going on?" Because me and Rodri, the other presenter, were just look looking at each other. <laughs> did we just did that just happen? All of a sudden, the poster boy, he's wearing the yellow jersey. Like three years into the into the, uh, our contract with the Tour de France, you know, brilliant. It's really good for us. Well, yeah, it's, it's perfect, yeah. isn't it? It yeah. just worked absolutely perfectly oh, in terms yeah. of that. Presumably at that point, you had no uh, expectation of what was going to happen the following year. No. Uh, well, obviously, <laughs> in, in that year, he crashed out, um, unfortunately. But, yeah, so in 2018, he goes and wins the damn thing. You know, Welsh guy winning the Tour de France. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? Yeah. Then we went ballistic. We were live again from the Champs-Élysées, and... We got a message through our uh, in your systems going, we're extending the show by one hour. We're like, <laughs> while we're on air, I go, oh, God. <laughs> Improvise for an hour. We got Garant Stad in to do an interview in Welsh. We got Brailsford in to do an interview in Welsh. In Welsh? We, yeah. Dave Brailsford lives in, lived in uh, Daney Olen in North Wales. Oh, really? As a kid, so he, spe he speaks Welsh. Sarah, Garant's wife. Uh, in in Welsh, we got Sarah's dad. <laughs> we got everybody <laughs> who could speak Welsh. On the sh there were so many Welsh flags in the Champs Elysees that, that day. Uh, oh yeah, you, you know the, the flag that that he had. Yeah, that's my flag. <laughs> so in the time trial the previous day, Brailsford ran through the zone technique, the media bit uh, backstage at the tour, and he saw us. He said, 
um, uh, we, we've always got a, uh, the, the Welsh flag on our gazebo outside yeah. the truck or whatever. So you run, so can I have this? And I, and I always buy the, the Welsh flag, the tradition that I buy it. And he r- ripped it down and gave it to Geraint. So at the end of the time trial that day, that's Geraint wearing my flag around his shoulders. And that's him on the Champs Elysees with the flag around his shoulders on the podium as well. And, and I, uh, my line was, um, I said, oh, this is really going to get him back on. This is really going to tug at the heart, heartstrings. And my line, line was, the dragon is around his shoulders, but it's also around his heart. And then and I started bloody crying. <laughs> As I said that, a tear came down my, my cheek. <laughs> and I totally choked up a lifetime. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Yeah. So and yeah, and apparently got a lot of people back home. But it wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't supposed to get myself. Yeah. But yeah, I yeah, I made myself emotional on live telly. So that was. A... I I would imagine doing that job, especially as a Welshman in Welsh language with a Welsh winner. There's just there was just I bet the that little bubble that you were in was absolutely buzzing. Well, it was because uh, we're such a small nation. It's stuff like that doesn't happen to us. We might win at the rugby once in a while, yeah, the Grand Slam or something like that. But um, you know, with football or any other big big sports, it doesn't really happen to us. You know, this is the equivalent of winning the World Cup. You know, mm-hmm. winning the Tour de France is one of the, the biggest sports um, uh, events of the uh, of the year. You know, it's one of the most watched sports events, you know, it's up there with the Olympics and whatever, what well, have you. I actually looked it up the other, the other day. It's allegedly, I'm saying allegedly because it's based on the ASO's figures, the second biggest sporting event in the world after the Football World Cup. Yeah. So annually it is, I think, the joint, I think the, the uh, Super Bowl is the only equivalent to the Tour de France on an annual basis. Yeah, and for something like that to happen to such a small nation as Wales, you know, a nation of three million people, mm-hmm. which doesn't really win that much because you know, it's such a small nation. It was insane and just blew our tiny little minds. We, we've done a very typically Welsh thing here and we've actually just talked about Wales <laughs> for like the last 20 minutes. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but now wrapping up our section dedicated to Wales... Um, the, the last one on your list was from the 2021 Tour de France and all things Wout van Aert. Oh God. Yeah. The, um, Von Tu, you know, when he won the Von Tu, it was just like, and it wasn't just one Von Tu, they, they climbed it twice. Yeah. And, you know, and so in that tour he'd won the Queen stage, he won the time trial and he won the sprint stage at the Champs-Élysées, which is incredible. You know, it's one of those things you never ever see. You know, that guy's so talented. He he's a better mountain domestique than a lot of the main climbers and the rest of the peloton. <laughs> he's just insane. You know, it's got this power as well. It's, just, it's not talent. It's just power. He's just that strong. You know? He's he's a big boy, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's big. He is one of the the few cyclists that is so dominant at what he does that. He doesn't he have like an, a glimpse of arrogance about him. Mm. And that, I think that's actually quite rare because you, you get a lot of, like, you know, like Sagan, like I love Sagan, but like, you know, he's, he's do it, pulling wheelies up mountains and things and he's like messing about and things. And there's kind of a bit like I'm, he knows he, he knew he was good and he let everyone know that, mm. which is fine because that was his thing and he was good. But like Wout van Aert, he just always seems just, he just wants to get to business. He doesn't want to faff about it. He's like, right, let's just go and win some stuff. Well, yeah, there's, there's been a lot of talk about him doing Giro, GC at the Giro. He mm-hmm. said, I don't want to do it because I don't want to come fifth or whatever. But, you know, if he was like 10 kilos lighter than what he was and a little bit shorter, you know, that guy will be winning t- um, uh, Grand Tours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then again, winning something like the... Um, the Von Tu stage in 2021, you know, that is a one-off. He would have been knackered the next day. He wouldn't have been able to do that again on the next stage, yep. you know, because that would have he would have left everything on that road. And uh, yeah, but I think if, if he was ten kilos lighter and a little bit shorter, then he'd be up there with Vingago and, and those, the rest of those guys. We were talking about the 2022 Paris Roubaix and all of the 
excellent things that came from that. Well, the, yeah, 2022 Paris Bay, that's when they were racing from the off, basically. And, you know, that first hundred odd kilometers without the cobbles where they just pooted along when, the, but there was uh, echelons and it just went, it just kicked off. Yeah. And it was like a, a, the craziest one day race I've ever seen from beginning to end. You know, it was just like, just nonstop action. Yeah. So it was probably one of the, well, for me, the best one day race I've ever seen. But the one the year before as well, the one of the terrible weather, the first Paris Bay fam, um, or the women's Paris Bay, whatever they call it, and it was uh, Lizzie Dignam. That was just a masterclass in cycling. You know the way that she went off on her own, rode, rode off solo in that horrible weather, in all the mud, and the way that she kept on correcting. You know, her back uh, wheel would slip out. She corrected, and just like it's just a masterclass in cycling. Proper skill, isn't that it? Was it's, one of the it's, best. That's not that's not blagging. No, that's one of the best cycling I've ever seen. For, yeah. for one person. Showing me how to ride a bike is that that's how you do it, Lizzie Dignan, twenty twenty one, uh, Pyro Bay. I remember me and Emily watching that, and we were just losing it. Yeah, which is why when we went to the charity event, the Garmin charity event a couple of weeks ago, I was trying to convince Emily to buy to bid an extortionate amount of money on Lizzie Dignan's uh, signed jersey. Oh God, how much did it go for? Two and a half grand, but she agreed <laughs> to ride with the person that. Won. Oh. I'm just hoping one day she'll agree to come on our podcast. She should do. Instead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's a bit of a legend. She's training for the Olympics now. Yeah. After two babies. Incredible. What a sports person she is. Mm-hmm. You know, just, what an amazing athlete. You know, to do that. It's just wild. Have, have you ridden cobbles? Yeah, I hate it. Same. I absolutely hate it. I went, um, we had a day off in Brussels, so I took the train out to Audenada. And I did a loop, it's called the Orange Loop, uh, that took in Copperberg, Oudacouamont, Ude- Ude- uh, and a bunch of other famous bits from uh, Flanders. And I was like, this is horrible. I never, ever want to do it again. So I've never done it again. I hate it. It's the most difficult thing. Uh, doing Cop- uh, Copperberg, right? It's the most difficult thing I've ever done on a bike. And I've done all the big climbs in the Alps, you know, like all of them. But... Doing that little 1K climb is the most difficult thing I've ever done in my entire life. Because it, it was in October, it was all greasy, it was just like, and I filmed myself doing it as well, and it's very, very funny. <laughs> it's like, it's, yeah, I was a mess. Never, ever, ever want to do cobbles ever again. And I have the utmost respect to all those guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen who do that, that type of racing. It's, you know, having done it for an afternoon, I never, ever want to do it again. <laughs> and this is why pro cyclists quit riding bikes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Time for another round of overrated or underrated. I'm going to read out a list of things and Perry's going to tell me if he thinks they're overrated or underrated. Okay. These were suggestions by Greg, who said, I'm a distance runner and motorcyclist who realized I'm missing the obvious best of both worlds. Your content convinced me to take up cycling and I'm loving it like McDonald's, it seems. And I uh, I have some beginner cyclist overrated underrateds for you. Carbon forks on entry-level aluminium bikes. Underrated. I think it's a, that means that it's a good idea, right? Yeah. It's so much nicer, the ride with, the, with carbon forks. Yeah. I actually really like this because that's the kind of thing that... Bike nerds like us will go, well, yeah, obviously it's better. Yeah. But actually, it is a really good beginner question because you probably go, well, I don't know. Do I need a carbon fork? Yeah. If you can have one, the answer is yes. It will well, nearly always be more comfortable. Yeah, because, you, you know, what? every time I've ridden a bike, a cheaper bike that has got an alloy uh, set, set of forks, it's like, oh, my God, this is so horrible. It's like such a harsh ride. Mm-hmm. You'd think it wouldn't make that much difference, but it actually does. It's also... Weight isn't everything, but it's also a very easy place to save a bit yes. of weight on a bike. I mean, the bike I'm riding at the minute is an alloy one. I've got a Canyon that I'm I'm using, and I just love it. Yeah. Underrated. Agreed. Yep. Uh, upgrade into a dedicated bike computer instead of a watch. Yes. Underrated. Yeah. It's... I mean, if you... 
I had was I, you're the Garmin Forerunner. Yeah, I have one. I, I had a very 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 early one, and yeah. And I did it on, on my wrist for a bit, and it's just like, that's it's really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> How fast am I going? Who cares? <laughs> it's like, hey, hey, it's yeah, always dedicated. It, it, you got bigger screen, does more stuff. It's in color, it's p- pretty pictures. Yeah, even the cheaper ones are, are great now. I'm going to disagree on this one. Why? So, uh, the modern watches do as much potentially even more than, well, no, at least as much as a bike computer. And uh, this is the triathlon in me, triathlete in me coming out. Running and swimming. What do you want to do? Because it's for? a watch, it doesn't mean it has to be on your wrist. Well, yeah, you can have those thingies that... Exactly. So yeah, you yeah. could just attach it to your bike. Yes, it will be a small but screen. That's what I did with my Forerunner. I got the attachment yeah. that uh, goes on the, on the handlebar, but it's still just tiny. Or you can be a sniper and turn your watch around so it's actually on the inside of your wrist. Or if you're on the hoods, or if you're on the tops like that. Well, like, just, just, well, if you're on the tops, you're not caring about anything then, are you? <laughs> you're not thinking, oh, how fast am I going? If you're going uphill, you are. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing 25 kilometers an hour up up to as. I've never done that but <laughs> in my dreams. But, yeah, anything. If you can see the screen... Yeah, definitely on the handlebars rather than, I mean, yeah, now those watches do everything. But the big screen, though, is, uh, that is, is yeah. a one hell. I think it, I think then that comes down to how much riding you're doing. If yeah. you ride loads or your intention is to do, you know, five hours a week, yeah. 10 hours a week, then it's probably the point where you might be going to, where you might be thinking a dedicated computer is a better option. For me, it's always been handy because when I go on tour, in on a tour bus... I take my bike with me, and if I, oh, it, it's brilliant. So, and if there's a oh, distance, you married between, your worlds <laughs> together yeah. so well. So, if there's a distance between two gigs. I will ride it. Yeah. So the first time I did it was probably 2010. Um, I bought one of those Caradice bags, you know, the the, the canvas bags. Yeah. Um, uh, like a saddle bag thing, and I went from we had a gig festival in Zurich. And the next festival was a week later in Saint Nazaire on the west coast of France. So the guys went back to the UK. I, I, I just cycled That's sick. A, across across France I love that. into a headwind um, for six days solid. But I still got there before the tour bus did, and and, and that's what I do. So and for me, a, a computer is very very handy. It's, you have to have one, really. I know you're going. I, I was going in a straight line, but still, the route. A big route on the handlebars in front of me. Next time an opportunity like that comes yeah. around, I'm coming with you. Okay, you know that's where that's where best friends really become oh, best, course, best friends. Of course, yeah. We could, we could do a film about it. <laughs> Should do it on a tandem. Yeah. On a, no, that's a bit too much. <laughs> yeah. No, but um, and the last time I did it was when I was on tour with Faithless, and um, it was obviously just before COVID, and um, I started from Zurich again and went to Ghent. So over four days. Day one was over the Black Forest. Day two was over the Vosges Mountains. Day three was over the Ardennes. And day four was over Flanders. But I missed out all the cobbles. Nice. Yeah, so I just love doing that type of stuff. But And you know, my Garmin, the Edge, it's like I've got a brand new one now, which is mint. And, uh, yeah, it's just it's take. well, I've done hundreds of thousands of kilometers on it. So Washing your bike after every ride. I don't like ride, uh, riding in the wet. There's a reason I don't like riding in the wet, because, you know, this thing here... Collarbone. That is very, very important for my job. So anything, any type of risk that's involved with cycling, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a risky sport anyway, isn't it? You know, mm-hmm. You're on two wheels, two skinny wheels, going really, really fast. Uh, <laughs> not really. But for me, the risk is too much, you know, I've... I've I've stacked my bike a few times and I've come off quite a few times and luckily I haven't broken anything. But, you know... Gets into your head, stuff like if that, that, if I, If that breaks, and I'm, it's a week before a tour, tour's over. Mm-hmm. So I, I can't do that. So um, I only kind of ride when the net weather's nice or, or dry. Yeah. So my bike doesn't really get that muddy, so... I don't do it. After. If I, if I was riding in the mud, then yeah, definitely because it would destroy my components. But 
the way that I ride, uh, no. So you're saying un- overrated. overrated. Overrated, yeah. I'm going to agree. Yeah. Because, yeah, I do believe you should clean your bike regularly, but that doesn't mean you need to clean it every single time. No. Yeah, I agree. Uh, joining group rides. Um, I do most of my riding on my own, so overrated. I live in South London now, but we moved five years ago. But there was a great group of people that I, was, that I rode with in North London. In, uh, there was a bike shop in Hackney called Pretorius, mm-hmm. Pretorius Bikes. And uh, yeah, so, and I used to ride out with them every Saturday and Sunday, and that was amazing. Really lovely, lovely bunch of people. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a solid group of cyclists as well. Teo uh, Gegenhardt used to come and ride with us. You know, Dan Craven used to ride with us as well. So we had some really, really good riders coming out with us. And some of the, you know some very very talented riders but it was so much fun and if you can get in with a really good bunch of mates then it's brilliant that that's the point i was going to make yeah it's underrated subject to the people you're riding with yes it's i mean you wouldn't go out to the pub with people that you hate right you know imagine you're going out to the pub and couple of people and you just don't like them yeah that would be miserable it's well, the same thing with bike, uh, riding your bike really it's what happens when i go to the pub with francis <laughs> Just have to put up with him for a bit. <laughs> He's going to see this, you know. Right, one last one. Yeah. Being a rock star, overrated or underrated? Overrated. Is it? Yeah. Uh, it will always be the like pinnacle pedestal job it, career thing for me. It, it. I. I. I am very, very lucky that I get to do what I do. Incredibly lucky, and I, and I do pinch myself actually when you're on stage going. Uh, but you know, it is. You just call it a job. It is a job, and you yeah. kind of get used to it. But I do step back and I go, not everybody gets to do this. What's you the biggest are. biggest crowd you've performed in front of? 150,000. Oh, that is absolutely wild. Yeah, those um, Hyde Park with Natalie and Brulia. Yes, I played with Natalie and Brulia for nine years. So, yeah, we did the... Um, it was... <laughs> um, there's a Princess Trust gig, <laughs> and... <laughs> about to go on stage and you know you go on he did uh, that gig everybody did like four songs and like, take that we're doing it it's a, it's a very pop thing yeah and um and it was, every, you'd get introduced and um there was this guy waiting to uh introduce us and we, we were stood on the side of the stage and so was he and i was looking at him and i know him from somewhere i'm like is that the singer from delamitri uh, he, he turned around to me and he winked to me and said, all right. And, then, <laughs> and, and he walked on stage first, obviously, and then to, uh, everybody, uh, and the pres- main presenter went, ladies and gentlemen, David Duchovny is bloody Fox Mulder. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> it's Fox Mulder off of the X-Files. He just winked at me. <laughs> so yeah, that was, yeah, funny little moments like that. Is uh, makes it, yeah. I think uh, when I occasionally meet uh, people that are at the absolute top end of whatever they're doing. I always find it really surprising to learn that a lot of people in that place are just kind of like normal people. And, yeah. And are, are actually also kind of like, oh, it's mad that I do this. Yeah, yeah. I think there's actually very few people that get to that level and actually just like, yeah, this is me. Yeah. This this is this has always been me. It's actually it's, kind of like, wow, this is this is this is huge. Yeah, am I any different to anybody else you've ever met? Yeah, yeah, you're a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if if you didn't know what my job was. You we, had champagne with breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> you bought your own caviar. <laughs> Apart from the champagne and the caviar, uh, um <laughs> I think I'm just a normal bloke. No, you are. You I'm are. a bit are. gobby, but you know, I'm just. You're, you're, yeah. You, you're very grounded. You're a very normal person, and that's what that just gets to do really cool stuff. And most people in the music industry are like that. I think I, there's a lot of celebrities who are who are not grounded though as well. You I have met a couple. There's some weirdos. Yeah. Oh, go on, but, give, name, but then again, in real life, in just in normal life, there are those people as well. True. Very true. It's mm-hmm. just like you know, there are some people who go, I don't. And sometimes those weirdos get to be famous. You know, it, it's not being weird. That's not a trait to be a celebrity. You know, being a weirdo. Yeah, it's, it's like in all walks of life, you get odd people. So enters Francis Cade and Jimmy Nichols. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, keep sending in your overrated, underrated suggestions to wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk and we might read yours out in the next show. Next on to Fluff Up of the Week. Fluff Up of the Week. This week we have a Perry edition of Fluff Up of the Week. Do you remember what you what story you were going to tell us? It actually isn't from this week. It was from wasn't it a touring a touring mishap? Oh sh! What was it? <laughs> oh yeah 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's all that rock star lifestyle, isn't it? Yeah. They st- those memories start disappearing. God, I'm so drunk right now. You wouldn't believe. No, it's all that champagne for yeah. breakfast. I haven't had a drink in two weeks. <laughs> honestly, okay. My fluff of it's not a fluff of the week. It happened years ago. Uh, I was doing a gig in Wales, uh, my old Welsh band that I had ages ago, um, Welsh language band, we did a gig in, gig in Cardiff and um, and we were in, I think possibly the halfway in of Pont Can, is it Pont Can Arms? Is that, is that a pub? Uh, it could be in the halfway, not the halfway pub. Halfway, what, in Flandaf? Yeah. So I, literally, I, th- I believe it's called the halfway because it's in between the two cathedrals. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Just off Cathedral Road, yep. and oh, uh, local knowledge. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we we're in the pub. We we're on our way to another gig, and we we're, were just having lunch there. And somebody came round. You know the um, the seafood guys. They sell cockles and mussels and uh, whelks and stuff. And so <laughs> so. I, I was eating my lunch, I had a really fancy some cockles and some whelks and some mussels, so I bought everything, one of each. And I, actually, I just love seafood and I ate the whole lot. I feel like I know where this might yeah. be going. <laughs> so then we had a gig in Lampeter, in the university in Lampeter, so in the main hall. So we were, <laughs> it was the first song and I started playing this. And I started, felt, felt really ill and I was going to puke. So... <laughs> I just moved, shuffled to the side of the stage and there was a curtain there. You know, there's curtains in universities, you know, it's it's yeah. the main hall. And there was some nice upholstered chairs there, you know, that that the principal of, or, and the, lecture, the main professors sit on. And I went the curtain and just went, and I puked all over them. And then, yeah, I emptied my, my stomach of vomit and went back and finished off the gig. So presumably everyone watching that would be like, wow, they are rock stars, absolutely wrecked off their heads, chundering up all over the place and still playing, but actually it was some dodgy shellfish. Yeah, it was <laughs> seafood, yeah, it was whelks. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the worst thing that's ever happened to me on stage. That's not that's not too bad. I mean, it was horrible at the time. Yeah, I'm sure and it And I felt really sorry for the chairs, and especially the person that had to clean them. I think that, especially afterwards. the person sitting on my <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I, I felt really bad. Yeah, Thank you for sharing that story. It's all right. <laughs> Time for more listeners takeover. And we have a question from Sam. I'm new to cycling, especially to road cycling culture. Is there a thing of what saddle to handlebar drop ratio is seen as appropriate or cool to be a serious cyclist? Or should I not care about this and just keep riding? I've consulted a bike fitting service for choosing the frame size and riding position and I'm at a five centimeter saddle to bar drop and I'm comfortable with it. The setup just doesn't look that sporty or pro, but I'm not that into racing and more into long distance rides. Should I be worried about this and does anybody else even care about this except me? If you're comfortable on the bike, then that's the right fit. doesn't matter how high your saddle is. It's all to do with how how long your legs are really. Mm If you've got short legs and you've got a high saddle, it's just not going to work. So um, don't worry about how high your saddle is, what it looks like. If it's comfortable, then it's the right uh, height. Uh, um, I've been lucky enough to go on uh, training camps with, with some pros, and I asked this same question to you a love pro. love a name drop, don't you? Oh, yeah. I didn't <laughs> see who the pros were. <laughs> the, um, and I asked the same question. I asked them about bike fit, and the answer was, if you can go out for a five hour ride and when you get back and you can walk without any pain that's your bike's right so if if that saddle height is fine for you if you can go out for hours and come back and walk around without any pain and not have any any issues on the bike it's exactly the right height for you there's no actual height that your saddle should be anyway when i got into cycling and cycling 
when I did that, cycling was like a social media thing. There was lots of little collectives popping up and everything was about being cool and looking cool. And at that point, which is probably a decade ago now, it was a big saddle to bar drop looked better. And I'm assuming that he, that Sam is thinking about that as in like, what should my bike look like? And I think the more I've gone on with riding, the more bikes I've ridden, the more I am in your camp where you are now, which is, I do not care what it looks like as long as it fits right. It rides well, it feels right. It has that nice, when, when I get out of the saddle, it's got that zip that I want it to have. And if that means that the bars are higher than the saddle or I've got, I don't know, one wheel, I don't, just, I don't know, something stupid. I don't care. I do not care what it looks like. I don't care what I look like on the bike or what I'm wearing. I want it to be comfortable and enjoyable. And I want to be able to keep coming back to that bike and enjoying it. And that's my priority. Well, yeah. And that's what everyone should prioritize, in my opinion. Yeah, even if you go back and look at the pros, you know, when they had steel bikes, you know, the top tube was basically like that. Yeah. Horizontal. You may maybe see that much of a... a um, the seat tube, you know, on some of them. You know, mm -hmm. So they'd be quite flat looking. So, you know, wouldn't worry too much about it. And it's all to do with, as well, with the top tube, how, how far, you know, um, wasn't it the giant TCR was the first bike with the top tube that sloped a little bit, I think. Um, so it's, however, whatever the angle is on your top tube, then your saddle is going to look higher anyway. So it all depends on the geometry of the bike itself. Yeah. Or yeah. the frame itself, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Sam, I would say, I feel like a proper, like, agony aunt. It's like a, well, like one of those little columns, isn't it? Dear Deirdre. Dear, dear Deirdre, yeah. I could be Deirdre. Um, d don't worry about it. Don't, don't care what people think. Um, enjoy riding your bike and do whatever you need to do to enjoy riding your bike comfortably and want to keep coming back to it. If you want to send in any questions or stories for us to read out on future episodes, you can by sending them to wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk. That's the third time I've said that. Hopefully we're going to get lots of emails this week. Uh, that's all for this episode. Thank you very much for joining us, Perry. Francis is back next week. Is he? Yes, he is. Francis is technically back now, but he will be in next week's episode yes. also. Uh, if you like this episode, leave us a five-star review. Follow, subscribe, share, etc. Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, I should have said that, shouldn't I? Diolch. <laughs> Diane. Learned that from Garrett Thomas. <laughs>